Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden talking to you from the Cabela's podcast studio. Yeah, the podcast is fully outfitted by Cabela's. Hope you're enjoying your day, your evening, your middle of the night, whenever you're listening to us. Great show in store for you. All sorts of things of interest and relevance to you. Our guest this week, Dave Nomsen, Vice President of Pheasants Forever. We're going to talk all things CRP and related topics. So stick around and find out what they mean to you and me and our bird dogs and everybody who's growing crops and not growing crops. Also, a public access tip, one of my favorite places. Some hunting strategy and dog handling advice from you folks. Some adventures and strategies, tips and tactics, and a little bit of everything else. It's all right here on the Upland Nation podcast. Designed for busy people who have more important things to do than listen to some guy crack a beer or make inside jokes. I don't know about you, but this time of year I'm trying to get organized when it comes to training. And that's one of the things that was just on my mind. Went out and worked with Flick just a few minutes ago. In fact, there's the alarm to remind me to go do it again real soon. But um, we're working on the usual stuff, but working really hard at uh, force fetching. Just that final three or four feet all the time, right to hand, and also steadiness to wing shot and bonk the fall at the end of the whole transaction. I'm organizing my training gear in the shed as well, finding all sorts of things in there that I forgot I had or couldn't figure out where they were. And uh, on top of that, uh, right now working on a big assignment for Pheasants Forever magazine, their upcoming super issue. So get ready for that, working on a valley quail stories so if you're interested in more advice on where to find them how to hunt them and that sort of thing kind of my thing looking forward to putting that together all right we're going to have a lot of puppy advice in an upcoming episode of the upland nation podcast uh but right now we're going to talk to uh, just a couple people via facebook who uh who will get you kind of primed for the next podcast jerry Marinowski is offering some advice i asked on facebook basically uh what kind of advice would you give to a first time puppy owner jerry Marinowski says a tired pup is more focused and easier to train i agree uh in large part you know not an exhausted pup but a pup that has kind of had the edge taken off him is uh, is great advice, Jeremy. And James Falconer says, so few people really teach their dog his name properly. Okay, uh, what do you mean by that, James? Well, what he means is when you say the dog's name, they should stop and look at you and wait for the next command. Man, I can't argue that one bit. I've been working on that with dogs forever, and it's so true. There are any number of ways for us to kind of get a dog's attention or wait until that attention naturally appears before we give the next command. I call that the golden moment, and I stole that from somebody else, by the way. But it does work. When the dog is ready, attentive, then you give the command. All right, Dave Nomsen is standing by. Just a couple quick uh, announcements for you. Why don't you visit my friends at Sage and Breaker Mercantile. Gun care and cleaning products crafted at the highest caliber. Sageandbreaker.com. Some new firearms grease and uh, gun cleaning chamois. Some great videos. And, hey, if you haven't noticed, go to the blog. I'm writing a monthly column for them, and it's kind of fun because I get to kind of riff on the subject of guns a little bit and you know i'm not a gun nut or anything so it's really a creative challenge and so far being uh, pretty well received sage and breaker.com and then once you visit them go to dogtra.com big sale on training collars right now at dogtra.com including uh, some of my favorites, uh, some of the mini collars for some of you puppy trainers or some of you small dog owners. My training collar of choice, the TNB Dual. Find out more about it and everything else at dogtra.com. All right, as promised, Dave Nomsen of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever joins me on the line. Dave, welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Scott. 
Dave, you, um, you, I think you invented pheasants forever. <laughs> Don't tell Howard I said that. But uh, you, you, you've been with the organization uh, a long time, and you've been here and there and back and forth. And you know, a few years ago, you, um, you basically took the pheasant bull by the horns, so to speak, and and moved to you know um, ground zero, South Dakota. Tell me what what you're doing these days on behalf of pheasants forever and quail forever. Well, Scott, I'm uh, uh, I'm currently the vice president of governmental affairs, and as you know, I've been in that role for quite a while now. Uh, I came to Pheasants Forever back in the early '90s uh, as a regional biologist, but but frankly, I kind of came here to uh, to get the organization started on federal farm policy and farm bills, uh, and I've been doing that ever since. And still, um, still hard at it. Uh, you, uh, your, your focus in, in South Dakota was kind of a timely opportunity, wasn't it? Well, it was, and uh, I'd actually been in South Dakota for, for quite a while previous to that. Uh, I did my undergrad and graduate work at South Dakota State University, so I got to put in a plug for the Jackrabbits here. And uh, you know, I, and then I spent a number of years on the faculty of the uh, wildlife department there. Uh, before I kind of went over to the uh, the private sector for the rest of my career. Um, Jack Rabbits, is that in Vermilion? That school? Uh, that is not. Oh, that's and, the other know, one. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to keep I'm going to keep talking to you anyway. Uh, that's <laughs> that's that's the university where the uh, that's that's where the coyotes are located. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'm up at South Dakota State in Brookings uh, with ah. Jack Rabbits. Well, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Vermilion because that's the home of the American Music Museum. Uh, in a, in another life, that it was is. one of my passions, and so I've st- stopped it in is. and visited all the funky, crazy, weird instruments down there every once in a while. People would suggest, yeah, yeah. and after after all these years, I uh, I moved over to uh, Minnesota when I went to work for Pheasants Forever, of course, and uh, so I lived here in Alexandria, Minnesota. Uh, which, as many people know, is the true uh, birthplace of North America. Uh, the uh, Kensington runestone that's on display in a local museum here was f- was found uh, in this area, and it uh, predates Columbus by uh, quite some time. And of course, if you're from up in that country, uh, uh, you know deep down in your heart that that rune stone was put there by Vikings, who, as you said, were That's right. They figured things out long before any of those Italians and Spaniards got over here. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, uh, go ufda, you know all that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you could do the skull count. Yeah. Uh, there we go. It, uh, people, just uh, just bear with me because, uh, you know, Dave and I don't get the chance to talk much uh, these days, and so we're getting caught up, but, uh, but it's all <laughs> relevant. In fact, um, you know, one of the things you've been doing for so long is exactly that, dealing with the conservation issues, not just on the ground stuff, but, you know, inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., where a lot of the real uh, rubber meets the road, sort of, so to speak. Um, and you've been recognized for that in any number of ways, including the George Bird Grinnell Memorial Award for Distinguished Service. Well, I can't even say it. Distinguished Service to the Natural Resource Conservation World, and we appreciate that. But uh, right now, um, one of the things that's very timely as we speak is this conservation reserve program. I'm I'm going to ask you just do us all a favor and as concisely as possible, kind of explain CRP to the rest of us. Wow, wow. Well, I, I, to do that, I'm going to have to go back to when the program first started. Yeah. And uh, CRP. Uh, Conservation Reserve Program was signed into law back on December 23rd of 1985. So it's a program that was initially put in place under the Reagan administration. And it has subsequently been reauthorized by Congress uh, several times uh, as part of what's just generally called the Farm Bill that happens approximately every five years or so. A massive piece of legislation that that covers everything from commodity and farm programs to conservation programs, uh, food stamps and nutrition programs, et cetera, et cetera. And and so about every five years, there's a battle over reauthorizing those programs and uh, keeping it uh, in the ground, so to speak, especially as it relates to CRP. 
So it's it's a it's a uh, program that's run by the Department of Agriculture, and you know most typically uh, 10 to 15 year long contracts to landowners for taking certain lands out of production and converting them to mostly grasslands, some shrubland, some tree plantings, uh, different types of habitat out there. And of course, it's that grassland CRP that, uh, you know, just literally gave us an explosion of upland game birds across the country. You you mentioned grasslands. Uh, I've also, of course, found wild birds in all those other places you described, from buffer strips and and w- almost waterways and mm-hmm. swales and shade trees. Right. Of course, wind wind breaks or whatever you want to call them out there. We've all poked around in some of those, but one of the things that all of those have more uh, uh, relevance to than what we love is hunting wild birds is soil conservation and related areas. People forget this is not really just a wildlife program, is it? It, it isn't. And actually, at the onset, uh, the word wildlife wasn't even in the legislation. Uh, when CRP came on the landscape, it was similar to its predecessor uh, that, you know, my father and grandfather probably referred to, uh, and, and we talked about a lot as, as kids, and that was the good old days of the soil bank era, the late 50s through the through the 60s, uh, you know, and ex- again, uh, massive amounts of cropland turned into grasslands that, that provided some incredible bird hunting for a long, long time, and then it left the landscape uh, through the 70s, and of course the 80s came along, and and with it, uh, crashing farm values, uh, commodity prices, and we just didn't know what to do with the massive amounts of production that we had out there. So CRP came along to do a little bit of soil erosion, but frankly, to provide uh, price support and uh, and uh, commodity price uh, increases uh, for farmers and landowners. And, and by that, uh, just for giggles, uh, the, the, what what we're talking about here is 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 in effect the feds mitigating supply versus demand. Exactly, exactly. And it was desperately needed at the time in the, in the eighties. Uh, farmland foreclosures were at you know then record highs, and so CRP was. What, you know, there might have been some folks interested in the wildlife benefits, but they were doing it for the economic benefits from the program, the stability in prices and the income stability and security that CRP's annual payments provide to those farmers. So, so if I'm a guy, um, walk me through it. I, I've got uh, 800 acres of, uh, of, of corn uh, I'm going to go to somebody in the federal government through somebody lower down on the on the ladder probably and show them that some of this land is uh, better put to conservation than to trying to eke, uh, a, a, you know, an insignificant amount of uh, crop and income out of how how are those decisions made? How is how does somebody decide it's good land or bad land for CRP? Well, uh, Scott, that that description kind of fits today's CRP versus the initial program as well. Sure, yeah. Uh, initially, uh, even the most productive croplands were put in CRP. Um, entire full farms were enrolled in CRP, and you know, by the time the first major reauthorization happened in 1990, what became 1990, the 1996 farm bill. The program had changed drastically, um, as you as you kind of alluded to. It became a soil, water, and wildlife objective-driven program, and it uh, uh, it replaced the supply control commodity program that it once was. And to do that, it now then targeted more uh, less marginal, less productive acres for the program. And so, um, in a nutshell, the program then um, makes a deal with the, with the landowner, the farmer in most cases, and it may be a corporate farmer, it may be a local family farm or something else, and they pay him or her by the acre for a certain number of acres, right? That's correct. It's, it's, it's a payment per acre, 
and it's typically a 10 or a 15 to 15 year contract. Okay. And just for uh, for our own edification, what is the uh, how much per acre does a, a guy actually get out of something like this? Oh, wow. Well, it it I tell you what it it varies considerably okay. coast mm-hmm. to coast of course, but you know, generally the less productive arid lands say in the western part of the country, you know, probably 30 to 40 dollars, maybe 50 dollars per acre. And then as you move east into the into the farm belt and in the lake states, you're probably approaching, you know, several hundred dollars per acre. Uh, a national average, 50 bucks an acre or so. Okay. All right. So now we understand it. Now let's go to the next step, which is why is any of this relevant to bird hunters? Well, <laughs> that's the fun part. Yeah. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about a, just a literal explosion of, of especially ground nesting birds on CRP lands. I mean, we're talking about tens of millions of pheasants produced annually on CRP in the Northern Plains. We're talking about, you know, seeing prairie chickens and and sharp-tailed grouse in areas of the Southern Plains where we hadn't seen them for decades. And, you know, you can't have all that habitat without benefiting other critters critters as well, whether it's white-tailed deer or you know, bobble links out on the prairie. Uh, it was, it just literally became a wildlife uh, legacy. And in fact, that was the term that was first used when it was reauthorized in 1986. CRP was America's wildlife legacy program. Now that just doesn't happen by magic. We don't wave a wand and get all that. There's some, some requirements as to what is planted in those places to help that. And I bet that's been refined over the decades as well. But oh, right, that's a, that's right a now. Great point. That's a great point. Uh, the initial CRP was just get some cover on the landscape, mm-hmm. prevent soil erosion. And to do that, a lot of the original CRP covers were monocultures. Crested wheatgrass was planted on tens of millions of acres, and I, it's got to be one of the most worthless covers for wildlife that was ever planted out there. You know, maybe fescue would be the same thing in the south. Um, a monoculture of, of a grass that just isn't pr- conducive to good wildlife production uh, or, you know, having wildlife benefits to it. Today's CRP, you know, is, is more of a diverse mix. Uh, it's more of um, na- native warm season and cool season grasses with forbs intermixed with it. So it's much more beneficial to wildlife than the original program acres were. Now, there's some uh, yeah, there, there's some flexibility in there. A guy who wants to can probably uh, choose a seed mix, if you will. Uh, can't he? Oh, there really is. You, you, can, you can put simpler, cheaper mixes out there, perhaps, you know, what we referred to years ago as dense nesting cover types of mixes, uh, fairly simple mixes of, of grasses with a little alfalfa, maybe a little sweet clover. Uh, and then on the far end of things today, you could plant even what's called pollinator mixes, highly diverse mixes of, of grasses and forbs that are beneficial to uh, everything from monarch butterflies to all sorts of of native and native bees, uh, and you know the thing that you and I like to talk about: those pollinator covers basically serve as brood plots for young pheasants and quail. All right, just go go one step more on that one, Dave Nomson here on the Upland Nation podcast. How do how do how do pollinator plants benefit brooding? Well, it's all about the bugs. Yeah, uh, as you as you know, it's all about the insects. The first. 10 days, couple of weeks of those chicks' uh, lives, uh, their diet is primarily uh, small, soft-bodied insects. So uh, you've got to go where you can find those bugs. And if you go to a highly diverse planting with lots of forbs, lots of different grasses, you're going to have a more diverse, larger insect population. So they're basically food plots for chicks. Mm, I prefer the crunchy ones, extra crunchy myself, but that's another story. We'll, we'll cover that in the next Upland Nation podcast, which is what you're listening to here, of course. That's Dave Nomson with Pheasants Forever. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Dave, um, we just passed, I think, it bring me up to speed, we just passed another milestone on, on a re-enrollment period. Am I correct to call it that? 
We did. We're in the middle of, of a general sign-up re-enrollment period right now, and uh, you know we're we're anxious. We're you know anxious about the numbers that come from this one. Uh, CRP has now been out there for 35 years or so, and and with the contracts that are signed today, you know it, it's it's kind of cool to think about CRP being on that landscape for say you know a half f- 50 years, yeah. a half century. Yeah, and so uh, it is uh, outliving its predecessor, the Soil Bank, and uh, you know I'm hopeful that we can continue to have a Congress that'll reauthorize and keep that program up and running. And and uh, but it does have some other continuous portions of CRP that are available on an ongoing basis across the country. There are various CREP uh, programs, conservation reserve enhancement programs that provide even additional benefits beyond the standard CRP contracts. And those are you know, you, uh, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll call them literally and figuratively uh, on the fringes, aren't they? You know, uh, well, they are, but I think they're also becoming, you know, in some ways a little more of the mainstream of the future of CRP. It, the program does need to continue to evolve to, to fit on that landscape uh, with our changing agricultural systems. So, uh, for example, uh, in South Dakota, there's a, there's a CREP CREP program that provides 15-year contracts, but those acres are also then automatically enrolled in the state's walk-in access program and available to hunters. Amen to that, and I wish that we could do that with every single acre of CRP Oh, it's a real well. win-win. Yeah, it is. And in fact, um, you know, down the road, maybe you're seeing, is there some potential for that in, you know, in the years to come? Well, you know, I remember some of the debate over that initially back in the 80s. And uh, uh, it just, it just wasn't going to, it just wasn't an option that was available at the time. Sure. And so what we've tried to do is, is uh, in order to get the acres that we need, it probably shouldn't, you know, be mandatory either, uh, even though there, you know, our tax dollars involve. But what we tried to do is 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 make up for that with incentive programs and with all of the state to state walking programs that have developed. And we now have a separate pot of money, separate from CRP, called VPA dash HIP, VPA HIP, Voluntary Public Access Habitat Incentive Program. That helps those state agencies implement larger, more substantive walk-in programs. And a lot of those lands end up on top of CRP lands. Yeah. You know, uh, the thing that's always puzzled me is um, why uh, they aren't, you know, farmers and ranchers aren't beating down the door to get at this CRP opportunity and and basically found money. Um, But Part of it, of course, is commodity prices. When you got eight dollar a bushel corn, you're not going to put your uh, acreage into something like this because that's when you buy the new combine. But uh, are there any other factors that affect uh, the robustness of a sign up period? Well, you know, you mentioned the big one is is the commodity prices, and and throughout the '90s and the first decade of of the 2000s, you know, for 20 some years, we roughly maintained a little over 30 million acres enrolled nationwide, uh, year in, year out. And uh, it was kind of like the stable good times. And then commodity prices did spike about 2005 or so, 2007, that period. And, you know, we lost a lot of CRP land. And uh, we're unfortunately down, you know, just north of 20 million acres today. So we've seen a substantial loss out there. Uh, over the last decade, 15 years. And, uh, you know, but we're seeing an uptick in that right now. And, and Congress did in the last farm bill, the 2018 bill, they did authorize an additional 3 million acres for the program. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can continue to move that back up. And uh, we'd love to see uh, back to the days where we've got at least 30 million acres enrolled every single year. And, uh, and that is one way we might be able to influence that. I know that Pheasants Forever is at the forefront in this area, but getting grassroots support for more acreage uh, by having you and me and everybody who's listening 
reach out to their elected officials, that really does have, have an impact, doesn't it? It really does. Uh, you know, those voices can really make a difference in Washington, D.C. I've seen it over my career many, many times. And uh, it, it, it just, it's just the way that things get done. And the system does listen to those voices out there. And, and of course, we had quite a story to tell years ago during the first major reauthorizations of the program. And uh, unfortunately, maybe folks have gotten a little lackadaisical, a little, you know, giving things for granted because it's been out there for so long. But uh, that's not the case. Uh, we've always got to be there uh, fighting for these programs to continue into the, fruit, into the future. All right. That is Dave Nomsom with uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Dave, I'm going to give you some time off. You take 90 or 120 seconds right about now to kick off your shoes and put your feet up while I make a little bit of money for this thing, and then I'll bring you right back in. Thanks a lot. And that is my cue to talk to you about two of my favorite sponsors on the Upland Nation podcast, Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Learn more at drtims.com. That's where you find out about the 30% discount on your first order by using the code UPLANDNATION. Hey, that works for me. 30% off on your first order. One of the things I like about Dr. Tim is, number one, he's a musher. He, he runs sled dogs, and also he's a veterinarian. So the guy knows of what he speaks when it comes to dog performance. And he knows what kind of formulations work for bird dogs like ours. An average of 87% of the protein in his food is derived from animals. You know, there's all sorts of other sources, and we've talked about some of those, whether it's wheat gluten or corn gluten. If you listened to last week's podcast, you know some of those are good. Some of those are not so good. Animal protein is always the best source, and Dr. Tim is averaging 87% of all the protein are animal derived. Learn more at D-R-T-I-M-S, drtims.com. And if you can hear me now, it's not because you have a Verizon phone, it's because you are employing some sort of hearing protection. My choice, ESP. Learn more at ESPAmerica.com. My New Year's resolution is to learn to shoot a little bit better. I'm going to take a lesson next week and I'm going to practice a little bit more. My custom-fitted ESP hearing protection devices are ready. I can still hear all of my squad mates making comments about my shooting skill or lack thereof. So the rest of you out there, if you want to make sure you get in on the joke, go to ESPAmerica.com and find out how to have those devices custom-fitted in the comfort of your own town. Now, this is a great predecessor to our upcoming podcast on advice to new puppy owners. I put that call out on the Facebook page and got all sorts of comments, and I'm just going to share a couple with you right here. Travis Powers, thank you for being such a great Facebook friend. Travis gives me a picture of a sign that he has posted in his training kennel, I think. The best advice he's ever received from Uncle Grouse at Aspen Thicket Grouse Dogs. I'm going to just touch on a couple of the things that Uncle Grouse says. Remember, first off, that puppy is a baby until about three years old. Have some patience. Do not constantly call me back, says the puppy in the woods. Let me hunt. And then, let me handle the birds and you keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. Three rules to live by. Oh, one more I better, I better bring up. Do not shoot birds I do not point. Let the birds teach me. Travis, looking forward to talking with you on the podcast next week. Uncle Grouse, thank you so much for some great advice. All useful if you'd like more information on us and how to contribute to the discussion. It's all at Facebook. Go to the Wing Shooting USA, USA Facebook page for, for the most uh, active discussion on this topic. I'll see you there, and I sure appreciate it. 
And with that, let's bring back Dave Nomson of Pheasants Forever. Dave, did you doze off during my lecture? I'm good. I'm good. Just thinking about a little pheasant hunting and some CRP. Okay. Um, and the latitude and longitude would be? <laughs> I figure if anybody knows where the birds are, you would. Well, uh, I tell you what, you know, there's been some incredible bird hunting opportunities out there. And it isn't just one state or two anymore. Everybody, you know, on South Dakota, of course, you know, is is the, the premier spot here on the planet. It has been for a long, long time. But I tell you what, the bird hunting in a bunch of states in the upper Midwest, uh, out in the West, uh, tossing some quail hunting that's that's looking real good the last few years there's just plenty of opportunities out there for bird hunters in many many states oh absolutely and uh, thank you for the cue by the way our this land is your land feature will talk about your home state south dakota and why i chose it as my number two state and we can argue that one off mic oh, sometime we could, we could. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not for the reasons a lot of people think but uh, i covered those last <laughs> week but but anyway uh back to our discussion from the uh cabela's podcast studio here in bend oregon where you might have heard my propane delivery guy just a few minutes ago <laughs> but anyway uh um yeah, and we can't live without it out here in the country you know that um, but right. uh, we're talking about the conservation reserve program and other related programs like that because they are your tax dollars at work to a great degree and uh, and the more you know about stuff like that the better everybody so heed his information now in the in the day and even to this day i think given the wrong set of circumstances a farmer or rancher can actually do something with that alleged uh, uh, fallow ground, can't they? They can, they can, and and you know today's CRP, um, there's there's something that fits on every farm, every ranch, period, uh, out there. Whether it's some smaller buffer practices to uh, targeted wildlife specific practices, things that are done under what's called the CRP S A F E state acres for wildlife enhancement uh, program that's been uh, widely successful around the country. Uh, there's just a little something for everybody there. And um, if there is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a world shattering drought or something like that, then all of a sudden we can see some of that land actually coming out of the program, can't we? Well, we we can, or we can see those lands providing uh, forage. That's yeah. that's critical yeah. to say ranchers during that time period, and and we do allow emergency releases on CRP lands. Uh, we we try to balance the wildlife needs versus the ranching needs, but you know without that CRP on that landscape, the, that rancher could really be hurting for forage. So uh, uh, CRP CRP can play an important role as a buffer, so to speak, uh, during those drought years as well. Hey, walk me through just a little patch of ground. Let's imagine in our minds a little patch of ground, and you can find one that probably works better than me. But um, let's take a corner somewhere on some guy's section and, and and tell me how this is actually practically applied. Give give work us through this whole process. Well, a, a, a farmer, or a landowner, the, the starting point, of course, is your USDA service centers, primarily for the most part. Uh, it's an it's an FSA administered program, technical assistance from NRCS, but the USDA service center is your starting point. And uh, with a with just a description of your land, you're going to talk quickly about the cropping history on that land and the erodibility of that land and those types of things. And and you're also going to tell them about what your needs are. What do you want to see those these acres do down the road? Are you primarily interested just in you know, soil and water conservation, or do you also want to uh, provide some wildlife benefits? And, uh, and and then the discussion's going to get a little further down in the weeds a little bit about what you might be able to plant on those acres and, and how you might design the planting with other types of wildlife habitat, perhaps. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's really kind of a cookbook of taking advantage of all sorts of federal programs. Uh, you know, when I started doing this, CRP was basically the program. 
Um, today, it's CRP plus a whole host of other programs uh, that are administered by USDA's NRCS. And in all total, it's about $30 billion uh, out there uh, on that landscape for uh, uh, all of these different programs. So it's all of them kind of working together. And it is a bit of a challenge to work through it all, but uh, definitely worth it at the end point. That's why we pay you the big bucks, Dave, so you'll work through it for us. <laughs> uh, but, but, but more cogent than that, how, how and when does a group like Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever get involved in, the, in that whole process you just outlined? Well, it's, I tell you what, it's, it's, it's back to the, you know, the days of what can make a difference out on that landscape. And for you know, the first, say, you know, eight, ten years of Pheasants Forever's existence back in the late 80s, uh, it was it was local projects with locally raised dollars. Uh, our chapters control their monies, and and they were putting those dollars into the ground. You know, tree planting projects, nesting cover projects. But at the same time, along came CRP back in '85, and and here's a program that literally impacted tens of millions of acres of ground out there, and you know, far surpassed all of our little organizational efforts as well-intended and as, and as productive and as good as they were, you know, it, it became the story of uh, the stroke of a policymaker's pen in Washington, D.C. could impact literally tens of millions of acres. And that were, that's still true today. And, and that's why all of a sudden Pheasants Forever and, and then Quail Forever became an organization that still does the local projects, but we also are there in Washington, D.C., because it's the combination of both of those areas that can really, really uh, push us toward our, you know, accomplishing our mission out there on that landscape. Worst case scenario, if, if people like you weren't over there lobby, literally lobbying in, in D.C., and, and not just with elected officials, but I bet you spend as much time in agency offices as anywhere else. But You know, uh, we, we do. Uh, it's, unfortunately. It's, it's, we, <laughs> exactly. We, we learned really quickly after the, the first major farm bill we worked on organizationally. It was kind of like, okay, we went out there, we got the bill, CRP was reauthorized, let's go home. Yeah, uh, it doesn't work. Doesn't work that way, and you do have to be there day in, day out. And it's frankly gotten to the point that, in a lot of ways, uh, believe it or not, the real work begins once the program is signed into law. Yeah, because and... it frankly it doesn't really mean anything unless those acres get to the ground, and and that takes following it all the way from a written law in Washington D.C into your local office, into the contract with a landowner out there for some specific acres, getting them planted, getting them up, managing them correctly. That's when it really makes a difference for wildlife resources. I used to write legislation in a big state to the south of where I currently reside, and that's why I'm up here and not down there anymore. Um, and what a lot of people may not be aware of is once you write a law and it is passed, uh, once you write a, a bill and it's passed into law, then the bureaucrats take hold of that and they write all the rules. And Dave, I would imagine that's probably where you guys really earn your salt. Well, you know what? It's, uh, that's a, that description is exactly spot on because that rules and regs process is incredibly cumbersome. It's incredibly bureaucratic, but it makes all of the difference in the world in terms of getting things done and having a successful program. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, we've got, you know, 250 or 300 biologists scattered around the country that all have day in, day out experience in how to make these programs work. So we really rely on their expertise. They're working with the farmers day in, day out. They know how the programs work. They know all the ins and outs to making it go from a law in D.C. to a successful program in the ground with that farmer or rancher. And just for the record, um, all of this money, and you mentioned a figure of about $30 billion earlier, um, it's tax money from you and me and everybody else who sends in their, um, their income tax return in April, right? It is. It's, 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 uh, those are federal dollars. Um, CRP runs roughly about $2 billion per year. 
so it's it's not cheap and it's expen- it's an expensive program but it's also one of the few programs out there that can make you know ecosystem wide landscape level differences out there for wildlife resources. Can you think of a bigger budget amount for any other conservation program than two billion bucks? It's it's one of the largest ones in USDA's history. I believe it. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's uh, yeah. Say what you will about government uh, programs and subsidizing uh, producers of commodities. Uh, Somewhere in there, the the payoff is exactly that. It's CREP and it's CRP and it's all those other acronyms that I can't remember, but that we uh, we trust Dave Nomson at Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever to keep his finger on. Dave, if you were to kind of sum things up, what can guys like me, hunters out there who would rather play with their dogs and chase ringnecks, what can we do to to make sure that uh, you're getting the support you need and that CRP and related programs actually stick around? Well, the, the best thing you can do is just make sure that your local connections, your local politicians, your elected representative, your senators from your state, you know, that they all understand how important the program is to you. And, and uh, uh, that's how things get done in D.C. And and it's it's increasingly challenging because we're just not a rural country anymore, and yet this is a rural program. So uh, we especially need some help educating people in urban districts, urban offices, about why that program matter should matter to them. You know, when it's not even in their area. Uh, yeah. And and that's where it's fun to talk about the economic benefits of of hunting or bird hunting anywhere. And what it does to the local economy. Uh, that's when it's fun to talk about, say, the water quality benefits of CRP lands. You know, those benefits accrue to every single American wherever they reside. Yeah, so I, just just helping tell the story. I can't think of a better ambassador than a hunter who, say, lives in a suburban area, hunts in the rural areas, and then might actually work downtown, if you will. Uh, this, uh, you know, people like us are uniquely qualified to um, kind of interpret the rural side for the urban side. And if we could do yeah. more of that, it would be helpful, I'm sure. Is there exactly. anything uh, anything right now? I mean, uh, we're, we're going to go live uh, in 24 hours. Uh, so uh, is there anything that we can do as hunters right now in the next few weeks that will have an impact for you? Well, right now, uh, it's, it's still about getting... Uh, acres and program into the ground from the from the last farm bill Mm -hmm. and so uh you know help educate people about the opportunities that are out there not just from crp but from crp and this entire suite of conservation programs take advantage of them Uh, there's funding available there's programs available um you know finding new projects but in the same breath, you have to, believe it or not, Scott, we've got to start thinking about the 2023 Farm Bill and reauthorizing this program and others once again. Wow. Um, you know, I just had a thought. Tell me about, uh, tell me whether you think this is crazy or not, but I was invited, uh, next, already looking at next chucker season, invited to a new ranch that, um, that does have some CRP ground on it, by the way. And, uh, I'm thinking right now I, I had to call that guy and make sure he's, uh, he's re-enrolling or enrolling more or something else. So if, if we're hunting on somebody else's place, we have a relationship I can't think of a better way to advocate for it than to call that guy and say, hey, sign up and add another 100 acres. There you go. There you go. And it's, you know, and it's it's really kind of interesting what you can do for various species with not that many acres. You know, it's fun walking those big CRP fields, and they're, they're critically important for two things, wildlife production and for uh, the hunting uh, that comes associated with those larger fields and larger groups of hunters. But then, say you move into the southern part of the uh, of the Plain States or Quail Range, boy, just a few acres here and there, scattered among agricultural fields, and all of a sudden you're talking about a farm that used to have two or three coveys of quail. Maybe now they have eight or ten coveys of quail. 
Well, you talk so, about you talk about how edges are are critical habitat yeah. attributes. Um, some of those little patches have, in effect, more edge uh, per capita, for lack of a better term, than any others. How about uh, you know field corners? You know, we got these giant center pivots. We all know what they are. Oh, absolutely. But every one of yeah. those corners doesn't get any cropping. Why can't we do something better with that space? Or can we? You know, and, and actually we can, and, and mo- in many states, those acres are now priority enrollment for various programs, uh, whether it's part of CRP or we have state wildlife agencies that have state uh, corners for wildlife programs uh, that do just what you're talking about. Well, there you have it. If you need your marching orders, you've now got them from General Dave Nomson with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever here on the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Dave, uh, enlightening, useful, helpful, timely, relevant, all of the above and more, as they say. Um, great talking with you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us on the podcast. And now uh, go out and scout some pheasant habitat for me and you to visit next fall, okay? Sounds good, Scott. Good hunting to you. Same back at you. Thanks a lot. And boy, oh boy, always great to talk with Dave. Uh, Like I said, and I apologize, we don't get to see each other much. I ran into him at a hunting lodge a few years ago, and then we pass like ships in the night at uh, Pheasant Fest. Uh, He's moving faster than me, and I'm moving pretty darn fast at Pheasant Fest. So thank you all for visiting with us when, when we did get a chance to do that in Minneapolis. And now is my chance to share with you some news from my newest podcast sponsor, Gunner Kennels. You know them. I've described them before as the Yeti of dog crates. Learn more about what I mean at gunner.com. And hey, the good news is, yeah, quit saying they're too rich for your blood because your dog is certainly deserving of the finest protection while in transit. And Gunner is now offering financing so everybody can make one of those Gunner kennels affordable. You have no excuses now. And if you need motivation, watch some of the videos at gunner.com. Dot com. The Gunner Kennel is the only pet travel crate that has earned a five-star crash test rating from the Center for Pet Safety. You want to learn more about them? Go to Gunner.com. That's where you'll learn more, more about all the upcoming new products as well. So uh, make yourself available. Get on the mailing list at Gunner.com. And if you want to save 10% off any order... Then you want to visit Dogter.com, including the T&B Duel, my favorite training collar, but all sorts of other great products. In fact, they have a March bundle deal. So many of their smaller collars and their IQ model numbers are on sale. You could save a lot more by adding my 10% discount to your sale price. You can get an IQ plus for just 162 bucks, And you can adapt that one to two collars and two dogs if you like. For all of that at dogtor.com, just use the checkout code SLUN10. You'll get 10% off anything over 200 bucks and free shipping on anything over 200 bucks. It's all at dogtra.com. So if you are interested in training your dog better, well, then use the same training collars that I use. Well, Woody Guthrie said it best, this land is your land. Uh, then he went on for about 52 different verses. I won't bore you with all of those, but I mentioned earlier that on Facebook I was asking everybody what they are doing uh, in terms of giving advice to new puppy owners, and boy, did I get a raft of great information. I talked a couple uh, versions of that earlier. But also on there I've been asked over and over again about my favorite states to hunt. One of the many reasons I started the new website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. I started a short list because there's really only three states that would be in that top tier, the, um, uh, the, the, the best of the best in terms of where I would go for wild bird hunting. Number one on the list I mentioned last week, 
Montana. I won't get into that, but I'll get into the number two state and Dave Nomson's new and old state, South Dakota. Two reasons, bird populations and welcoming attitude. They got a wacky non-resident licensing arrangement. It's a little bit expensive, but if you're going to travel 400 miles, who cares about a $105 ticket? It's not that bad, especially, especially if you weigh some of the other strong points for South Dakota. It's a mecca for pheasant hunters because a bad hatch in South Dakota is better than all the good hatches elsewhere combined. Your flushing dog is probably going to feel right at home in South Dakota's big fields, whether they're rank CRP or sloughs and swales where the pheasants will skulk away from a pointing dog. So bring your Labradors, bring your Springers, bring your Cocker Spaniels. Even they could probably figure out how to bring back a pheasant if you shot one. Perfect habitat for not only ringnecks, but flushing dogs too. The other fun thing about South Dakota, if you, especially if you're from the big city or even a suburb, is the farm country hospitality and small town friendliness and a whole bunch of lodges, if that's your cup of tea. You'll find more hunting lodges in South Dakota than probably any, well, probably all the rest of the country combined. From budget level to the lap of luxury, you'll find it all in South Dakota. I know I sound like a commercial for South Dakota hunting, but it's because they deserve it. No dogs were harmed in the making of this little spot called This Land is Your Land. Enjoy yourself in South Dakota. My number two on the list of three favorite places to hunt birds. Brought to you in part by my new website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. That's where you sign up for the mailing list, and you could win a pointer over and under shotgun. Finally, thanks again to ESPAmerica.com. Custom-fitted hearing protection. It won't fall out in the field, and you will be able to hear all your bad jokes in the range as well. So thank you all, ESP America. We're doing such a great job. ESPamerica.com. Yeah, I know I talk a lot, but that's the whole point behind a podcast. I hope most of what I say is relevant, timely, useful, helpful, and I hope none of it insults your intelligence or wastes your time. That's one of the things that I hope makes the Upland Nation podcast different than all those other folks out there. If you will, please, if you agree, subscribe, rate, or review this podcast wherever you get it, especially those folks who are on Apple Podcasts. I could use your votes. Thank you very much in advance. If you want to talk more, go to the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page or the Upland Nation Facebook page. I look at all of those several times a day, and I will respond to virtually every question, comment, or suggestion. So if you have one, don't hesitate. To share it. And in the meanwhile, I will be out with my good dog, Flick, working on his steadiness and getting him a little bit of exercise. So I hope you will do the same. Give your dog a hug. Give your spouse a hug. Pat your kids on the head. And don't forget, the collar goes on the dog and not on the kid. I don't care how ill-behaved they are. Thanks again for listening. I'm Scott Linden. It's the Upland Nation podcast. Have a great day in the field.